So welcome everyone to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Glad you're here for SF Song of Mindful Mondays. My name is Augusta Hopkins and glad to be here with all of you. We'll start with a sit after a brief round of introductions and then I'll offer some words for reflection and then we'll see what kind of conversation is here. Is the volume of my voice okay? Okay, great. So let's start on Zoom. Or maybe I'll model so you know what the start is. So simply to offer your name and your pronouns and a word or two. If you need a sentence, that's fine, but a brief sentence. What's alive in you? What are you, what are you coming here with? So Augusta, she, her. Hmm. Right in this moment when I check in, what I feel is a version that as I try to look out at you, I'm really just staring at myself in the mirror. So we'll see how I learn to navigate that or how technology might change in the future, but that's what's present in this second. And I'd love to see, see hellos, hear hellos, see, see, hear hellos from Zoom folk. Name, pronouns, what's alive? Um, I'll go. Um, I think uh, Marcella is going to pass. And um, I, uh, sorry, my name is Noam. Uh, I use he or they pronouns. And uh, I, I had a busy day, though punctuated with a nice walk. And so I'm here really looking forward to uh, some unbusyness for a little while, and then I have to leave early and be busy again, but I'm looking forward to that part. Thank you. Thanks, Noam. Yeah, we'll take those moments of unbusyness. Hi, my name is Walt. My pronouns are he, him, and I am here to chill this evening. Uh, recently, uh, over the past uh, probably three weeks uh, or a month, I've been through tons of medical diagnostic tests and things of that nature. And uh, they all have my head spinning. And so I'm, I'm, I want to unspin my head. And that's why I'm here. Thanks, Walt. Um, maybe we'll start with you. Oh, I'm Brendan, and uh, I go by he, him pronouns, and I am discombobulated, but uh, but I'm I'm kind of okay with it. <laughs> it makes sense right now. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Ron. He, him. <clears throat> um. I'm feeling kind of warm and fuzzy and present. Hi, I'm Quinn. Um, she, her. Um, I'm feeling a little curious right now. Yeah, because of, I guess, my first time here. And yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lisa, she, her. Um, I'm feeling irritated <laughs> and irritated. <laughs> yeah. Hello, my name is Esteban Lepe. Uh, first time here. I feel a little anxiety, yeah, but at ease. Uh, yeah, right, both can be here. Yeah. Right on. Great. Welcome. Thank you. You can just lay that on the floor there next to you. I will, they won't be able to hear you, but do you want to say your name and pronouns sure. and what's up? I'm Tom, and uh, I uh, really enjoyed the place out of the lobby by teaching last week, so I'm very excited to be here with this new class. And somehow I hurt my lower back somehow doing something, so I just my body is like, you know, like, uh, here. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you very much, Tom. Yeah, 
welcome, welcome all of you and welcome all of the parts of you, right? Sometimes we feel like, oh, I wanna feel warm fuzzy. That sounds great, can I feel warm fuzzy? And you know, you can't feel warm fuzzy all the time. Like it just doesn't work like that. And one of the things that, that helps me when I'm not feeling warm fuzzy is to know that if I was feeling warm fuzzy all the time, it then becomes like this, like that becomes flat. We need the relationship of the ups and downs of the, the joys and the sorrows in, in Buddhism. We have learned from the Buddha of the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows, like they both exist. And when we try to push any of it away, like we're probably not gonna try to push away the 10,000 joys, but you know, we start to try to push away the 10,000 sorrows, we end up pushing away everything. We don't get to pick and choose. Sometimes we think, I'm just gonna push away that uncomfortable thing. But actually start to push away our entire lives and we miss our lives with all that energy about, ah, you know, like in my experience anyway, trying to keep ourselves safe. I think that that's where that comes from in me is I want to, I want to feel comfortable. I want to feel safe. I want to know that I'm okay. And this other thing, this radical thing that we're learning to do is to just stop. Thich Han said many, 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 many thousands of times that we stop and look deeply. But we stop first. And maybe it takes 10, 15, 20 years of practice of stopping before there's the, enough safety capacity to do, the, to do the deep looking. So that's where we begin. Just like practice stopping. And as we start to stop, we notice how turbulent it is. It is, but there were some reflections today of just different versions of discombobulated, right? Settle, I need to settle or chill. I've been busy, I'm discombobulated. Like, yeah, hello, this is life, right? We're agitated or irritable or I'm feeling a virgin. Like, yeah, <laughs> so like last week we began with a conversation on dukkha, the first noble truth, unsatisfactoriness, suffering, however you wanna name it. Like, yeah, the Buddha recognized that there is this universal truth and the practice is not to become free. Oh, let me try that again. If we go about trying to not suffer, we recognize very quickly how that is not possible through that path. But as we come to recognize, oh, oh, this is suffering. I offered last week, straight from the, we think, words of the Buddha, dukkha is to be known. But as we know it, that moves us towards freedom. Not pushing it away or pushing it down or running away from it or trying to fight it. It's like, oh, dukkha, hi. I see you, I recognize this. And so I've got lots more thoughts on that. We'll see what ends up coming out tonight. But I just wanted to offer that however you're feeling, you're alive and that that's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing in Zen. Ah. <laughs> and right now in this moment, I like feel this moment of pressure. I'm like, oh, is it to be born or is it to found the Dharma? It doesn't really matter. But in Zen, there's a story that in the turbulent, turbulent seas of the oceans, all the worlds of oceans, there's one life preserver. You know those round life preservers? that you see in the movies that are on big boats, there's one life preserver that's been flung out into the sea. And to be born in this human condition, human existence is as if you're a sea turtle that comes up for air once every thousand years. And you happen to come up into that life preserver. Like this is precious, this human life. And to have found the Dharma or to have been curious enough to explore the Dharma, you might find a little bit more freedom in this, in this crazy ride, in this crazy ride. So we'll practice. We'll practice tonight and see if a little settling happens just because we get out of the way, right? Just because we get out of the way. Tigran Han offers, I'm not going to try to stop talking, but Tigran Han would offer, you have a glass of juice. Imagine a pulpy orange juice or an apple cider when you first shake it up in the bottle of the jar and you pour it, or maybe it's fresh squeezed, like super fancy, it's opaque. You can't see through it. It's not possible. There's too much stuff in there. But if you actually put it down on the floor or on the table and you leave it alone, <laughs> you don't actually stop, the sediment settles of its own accord. 
don't have to do anything. They just to rest and stop. When Will checked in, he, his hands did a little bit of this settling. Like, that's what happens. And we're conditioned to think we have to do. You know, we need to get in there and do. But I was offered a quote recently from Ajahn Brahm. He is purported to have said, I don't know, I didn't hear from him directly. I've heard that from Ty directly. That you can't get a glass of water to be still if you're holding it. The glass of water will not become still if you're holding it. You cannot hold it still. You, you can't. But again, if you put it down, voila, right? Like, so we practice to put it down. So this evening, as we sit together, all kinds of visitors will come. Uh, maybe my last quote before we settle, we'll see. But Ajahn Chah just arose in my mind. He offered that the mind becomes still like a clear forest pool. All kinds of wonderful and rare animals will come to feast at the pond at the clear still water, but your mind will be still. That is the gift of the Buddha. And that's the gift of the awakened mind. It's not flitting around in response to the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 stars, to all the shit, to all the dukkha. It's like, oh, hi, hi, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Or, oh, hi, warm fuzzy, like this moment of joy. We can appreciate it and not clamor or onto the joy or push away the, the dukkha. It's like, oh, yeah, sukha, dukkha. Mm, hi, I see you. Yeah. So let's sit. Let's see what happens. Let's see what's here. What, what crazy cool animals are going to come to drink? And how are you going to be able to be? Be, just be with it. So finding a posture that supports you. You might want to move and stretch a little bit to find that posture. You might find you want to stand or lie down. I don't know if you can lie down at the desk there or not, Tom, but I know for me, when my back is bothering me, as it does sometimes, I find lying on the floor and getting my calves up. Maybe at the height of this chair, or I used to have a coffee table where I could rest my calves, really reduces discomfort in the low back. Or when we do deep relaxation, which we'll do at some point in this group, I brought in my laying flat on the floor and then I brought in my legs, like more broad than two shoulder widths apart and then let the feet turn out. And that also reduces pressure on the low back. Standing is a great posture if you're sleepy. And if you're sitting, whether in a chair or on a cushion on the floor, taking care that your hips are above your knees, Again, so as to support the low back. Sitting, standing, walking, lying down. Whatever posture we might find our bodies is a posture within which we can cultivate awareness, presence. And through that cultivation of awareness and presence, Ease arises, just like the settling pulp in the juice or the stilling glass of water or a stilling pond. It's what happens. But we're not trying to like get ease, do ease, create ease. If there's any doing, the doing is befriending what is, recognizing what is, allowing it to be. Oh, it's like this. That's Ajahn Sumedho. Oh, it's like this. Mm. Mm. I'll invite the bell to sound three times to support us in settling into our bodies and I'll offer some more instruction and then we'll settle into silence. And we'll meditate together for about half an hour coming home to ourselves again and again, more and more fully, more and more deeply, as much as we're able to. All kinds of stuff is gonna come and go, it's no problem, it's all impermanent. We're gonna practice knowing, being with, and resting.
Listen, listen. The sound of this bell brings me back to my true home. So there will be a little wake up sound and then three full invitations of the bell. Riding the sounds of the bell, allowing your heart, your mind, your gut, your body, your being to receive the bell. Beautiful sound of the bell calling us home to ourselves. A little wake up sound to let you and the bell know I'm going to invite it to sing. Resting down, down into the earth, down into your body. Feeling the support of the earth through the furniture, through the floor making contact with your knees, through your seat, through your feet, Resting down. And perhaps tending to a few cycles of the out breath, feeling the letting go of the breath as we let go a bit with the body, feeling how the exhalation can support a settling down. Feeling the breath leaving the body. Feeling the body letting go. Cultivating ease and relaxation by connecting down into the earth. And 
and feeling the embrace of the earth. And the hug of gravity. And bringing attention to the inhalation. I'm feeling, experiencing the energizing nature of the in-breath. Noticing perhaps how the in-breath supports wakefulness, alertness. Allowing the crown of the head to lift up toward the sky. Which encourages the chin to tuck ever so slightly. And with the next inhalation, broadening the shoulders opening the heart center and the chest a little bit. Taking up your space. alert and dignified while relaxed and at ease. Both. Relaxed and alert. Not so alert that we're tense or efforting. And not so relaxed that we're dozing or falling asleep. And somewhere in the middle. A relaxed alertness. And allowing your own practice to unfold. Perhaps you're supported by resting in awareness. Noticing what you become aware of. Allowing those 
magical beings to come and go as you bear witness. Enjoying the bells. Just as we observe the sound of the bells from the church, we can observe the stories and thoughts in the mind, physical sensations, everything and anything coming through the six sense doors of eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Resting in awareness. Or we can choose a focus, something more specific to rest into, rather that broad awareness. One's no better than the other. Any ways to practice? If a little more support feels like it would be helpful today, choosing an object to rest into can be very skillful. The breath is a common object, as is a rising and passing of sound, awareness of the body as a whole resting here, or a specific sensation in the body, the hands or the feet. None is right, none is wrong. Each of those practices supports us in coming home to ourselves, supports us in resting in the here and now. Trusting your own inner wisdom and making a choice. And then holding that choice for this practice period. Resting and opening. Receiving each arising and passing present moment. Whatever it brings, we can welcome it all. Resting in awareness.
Resting. Resting into the present moment. Letting go of our agendas. Noticing what's here. Noticing what's here and allowing it to be. Reading the arisen experience with kind attention.
cultivating our ability to be open and curious, receptive. Like that still forest pool. Not responding or reacting, but just receiving. Cultivating mindfulness. Presence. Embodied awareness. Coming home to ourselves. Opening to the experience of the moment. Coming home to yourself, to your heart, to your gut, to this moment.
Letting go a little more fully. And a little more deeply. It's okay to be here now. To give yourself this opportunity to stop. Practicing befriending ourselves, befriending each arising and passing present moment. Each moment arising and passing.
Gradually, gradually bring in movement. Rest shoulders, ankles, neck, whatever feels good. And then light, however sighted you are. And as you bring in light, noticing what you see. It can be supportive to choose an arena to focus on. So maybe it's to notice color and name color. Or shape and name shape. Or specifically look for circles and lines. Kind of a powerful way to come out of practice. And it's also really helpful to twist when we've been sitting still. So you might twist as far as is comfortable for you to one direction, rest there for breath. And then come back towards center and rest in the other direction. Not overdoing it, just twisting in a way that feels comfortable. And coming back to center as you're ready and seeing if the body wants to stand or stretch in any other ways. This body is our vehicle for liberation. We cannot neglect it. It's really important. Uh, there's a quote from the Buddha that I received in a postcard from Thailand. It said, this body, if used well, leads us to the other shore. If used poorly, just keeps us trapped in samsara. So let's remember this, this body. Also, the Buddha is quoted as having said that everything that we can experience is in the body, that this is enough for complete and total awakening. We don't need some other things. So tuning into the body, coming home to the body, super important. I've had lots of different things on my mind that I might talk about this evening. And just from our check-ins, I'm feeling this part just started in one particular arena. We'll see. We'll see where we see, see where it takes us. So Thich Nhat Hanh taught very clearly, I think rooted in the Yoga Char school of Buddhism. That we have a mind consciousness and a store consciousness. So I can keep uh, within the Zoom. Can you hear me okay? I'm down here in the store consciousness.
There are lots and lots and lots of seeds. Bija is a Pali term or Sanskrit term, I'm not sure, for all these little seeds. That there's a seed of mindfulness down here. There's a seed of aversion. There's a seed of irritation. There's a seed of warm fuzziness. There's a seed of questioning, wondering, curiosity, excitement, anticipation. Like it's all here. Everything we can experience is lying dormant in the store consciousness. And then something happens. You come to a new place or someone cuts you off in traffic or you're feeling excitement or anticipation or you've been super busy or getting, having to go to the doctor a lot. Like life happens and a seed sprouts. And let's say it's not the most attractive seed. Can you see that? Yeah, great. Maybe it's not the most attractive seed, something you would rather not experience, like many things in life, unfortunately. As I began this evening, we don't want to try to like push them away because I'm pushing away everything. So something shows up and we recognize it, right? Duke is to be known. We recognize it. Oh, hi there. Breed, aversion, whatevs. Hi there. And then we can breed it with the seed of mindfulness. The seed of mindfulness can embrace it, whatever it is. It's like, oh, this is what's your, oh, it's like this. And we get to feel it, which I hope is part of what you were doing in that practice period, in that 30 minutes. It's like, oh, this is what's here. Oh, this is what's here. Oh, this is what's here. Can I be with it? Mindfulness embraces it. And due to the embrace of mindfulness, that particular seed, if if treated kindly with loving, care, and attention, goes back down into the stored conscious and it's a little bit smaller and a little bit more dormant, less likely to sprout up. And because we've activated the seed of mindfulness, after mindfulness has done its job, that seed goes back down a little bit stronger, a little bit easier for it to pop up to the surface. And we can practice this on the cushion, like we did tonight, like noticing, 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 and we can practice it in our lives. Like, oh, this is what's here. This is what's here. And what's my relationship to this thing that's here? And for me, anyway, sometimes it takes like lots of layers of it before I really, like before the seed of mindfulness is there, there's many rounds, but it doesn't matter. Wherever the seed of mindfulness sprouts, it can greet what's arisen. Yeah, so we'll talk more about that as we go on and sit back down again. But are there any questions about this this lovely diagram or the idea of bija or seeds sprouting? Is it pretty clear? I love how simple it is. Can you see it, Tom? Great. Are you welcome? And of course, I used purple walls because it was here. So these seeds sprout up. And mostly, unfortunately, I think we don't really notice it. We just get caught. <laughs> we just get caught in them. <sighs> I remember the first time I sat with New Generation Sangha, which was the Plum Village Sangha I sat with after coming back from Plum Village in 2006. It was my first Sangha. Maybe it wasn't the first night, but it was really early on. Something occurred. And, ooh, I was judging. And I was judging myself. And then I was judging myself for judging myself. And then I was judging myself for judging myself for judging myself. And it was just like, I don't know how many layers of judgment were there. But then suddenly I, I saw it. Oh, no, oh, I'm judging myself. And the whole heap poofed away. And the Buddha is quoted to have said, one spark of insight burns down a heap of defilements. And I think what that's what that moment is like. It's like, oh, oh, well, we wake up for a moment and we're not caught in our habits. We all have habits, no problem. Some of them are wholesome, some of them are not so wholesome. We practice to recognize them and then we cultivate this habit of noticing. It's, it's all impermanent, it's all changing all the time. 
our practice can allow us to see more clearly. And through that scene, shit changes. We don't have to like get in there trying to fix ourselves. Like Buddhism is not a self-fixing, self-help practice. It's a coming to know, coming to see, coming to recognize. And maybe gradually over time befriending ourselves as we are befriending the experience. It's okay. It's unpleasant. It's pleasant. It's neutral. This is what's here now. And slowly, maybe we don't shit on ourselves as much. Maybe we're gentler with ourselves, kinder to ourselves. Here at the Dharma Collective, we have lots of beautiful plants. If you look on that shelf above the welcome desk, or if you remember that shelf, if you're not here right now, those plants look so happy. I look at them right now, they're vibrant, beautiful shades of green, lots of different shapes and forms, some of them coming up, some coming down, some broadening out. They look very healthy. How many of you have plants at home? Almost everybody. Yeah, everybody. How do your plants look? Do they look like that? <laughs> Mine neither. <laughs> <laughs> they don't look like that. Maybe for a moment, occasionally. <laughs> but usually, they're in some kind of range of experience. And so I practice. You know, I practice to look at them and recognize, oh, what do you need? I check the soil. I try to remember when did I last water it? You know, it's like, oh, do you need more water? Did I overwater to need less water? Maybe it's a little too cold. I need to move you into a warmer place. Or maybe you're getting too much sun. You need a little shade. Or not enough sun. Move it into the sun. Right? We recognize there are lots of conditions that have come together to allow this plant to thrive as those are thriving or not thrive as happens some of the time, right? Have you ever blamed a plant? It's kind of brainwashed actually. <laughs> 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 yeah, and you realize it's not the plant. Yeah. Right? You realize it's the match. The match isn't working. Right? It's just that the match isn't working. Right? But we don't. We're, we know we're in our crazy if we blame the plants, right? We like, no, it's not the plants. It's the conditions. It's the conditions, the causes and conditions that have come together in this moment to influence this moment, to influence us, to influence the weather, to influence the plants. Like, oh, it's just causes and conditions. There's no fixed thing here. It appears that way sometimes because it's a flow, but it's all causes and conditions. And when we see that, when we recognize that, then we know we can influence with another condition or another cause. Gentleness, kindness, a little self-love. This skin on skin has been such a powerful practice for me when I notice that I'm caught in some self-defeating beliefs, some, some as Les Tara Brock would say, trance of unworthiness, like this delusion of some nonsense is to hug myself. And for me, the skin on skin has been really powerful. Some people are supported by a hand on the heart or a hand on the belly or two hands on the heart. Um, Glenn Schneider, a, a Plum Village teacher here in Berkeley, he once offered a practice, which I think came from a Tibetan tradition from a student of his, of getting his hand like up on his face, thumb in front of the ear, fingers behind the ear, like all up in here. And it's not very comfortable for me, <laughs> but I could feel how getting that real skin contact and the pressure of the hug was super powerful. So I, I ended up adapting it and, and coming around in this way. But when I have on a short sleeve shirt, I'll get 
up underneath my sleeves so I can give myself a hug like this, but with skin. For me, the skin is super, super helpful. And that's the way that I bring mindfulness in. You know, tender, loving care and attention. Not just a magnifying glass or a microscope. Like, that's not what it's about. It's kind, loving attention in the present moment. Mm, it's like this. Can I show up for this moment? Can I show up for myself as I am, as it is? And we can practice that when things are going as we would wish for them to go as well, right? We can practice this present moment awareness when things are super cool, when we're in the warm fuzzies so that we can feel it, so that our nervous system can become more attuned, more familiar with that pleasant state of mind, state of heart. So that's more available when things do get squirrely again, because we're going to get squirrely again, right? It's life, ups and downs, that's how it goes. 10,000 joys, 10,000 sorrows. There's no escaping that. And even the Buddha in his fully enlightened state, he still had dukkha. He still had back pain. Specifically, it's documented in the suttas. He still had back pain and had to care for that. Oh, kind attention, right? Ah, it's a practice. It's a seed that we can water and cultivate so that it sprouts more easily. Hmm. Before we open up for conversation, I just want to reiterate and encourage you to practice this week noticing, noticing and greeting, like, oh, this is a pleasant moment. I want to feel it. As Peggy Roward would say, another Plum Village Dharma teacher, soak it into the marrow of the bones or soak it into the hard drive. Oh, this is a pleasant moment. Thich Nhat Hanh would say, presence moment, wonderful moment. Each moment that we're present is a wonderful moment. I don't know if you always feel that way, but when you have a pleasant one, like, oh yeah, hi there. Allow mindfulness to shine on that. So the pleasant is more available to us. So that seed of pleasant is a little closer to the surface into the mind consciousness. And then when we have an unpleasant moment, when we have an unpleasant moment, can we show up for that? And sometimes we're not in a place where we feel comfortable being like doing a full embrace. You might try along with me now, just a little rub of the finger from the other finger can offer kindness and tenderness. Or sometimes we'll notice that our hands are touching without even like, we're not like trying to hold our hands. They just happen to be touching or they're on our lap. We can feel that embrace. We can just bring our attention to it and feel that hug. Sometimes I'm able to feel how my skin is giving me a hug 24 seven. I don't feel it 24 seven, but it's actually happening 24 seven. It's like, oh yeah, the skin is giving me a hug. It's here holding me. And the earth too, gravity, a hug. The earth is hugging us to her. So we can touch into that when we need a little support and a little extra love. And when we touch into that, we're waking up that seed of mindfulness it's becoming more available, more accessible. And when you notice yourself judging the plant, you know, shitting on yourself in some flavor, it's like, oh, what are the conditions that are present here? And how can I inform them? Sleep, food, exercise, alone time, social time, outside time, inside time, meditation, water. I, need to go, I just need to go to the bathroom, right? I've been so busy, I didn't even go to the bathroom. Like, to check in, what do I need? How can I care for myself in this moment? Hmm. All right. So as we open it up and pass the mic around, I'd love to hear anything that resonated for you in the talk or what happened in your sit, how your practice has been this last week. And were there any times this last week that you were able to recognize dukkha and turn toward it? Like, oh, this is dukkha. Hi there, I see you. Like, what, was that available to you? Maybe not, that's cool. And you never heard about it before because you weren't here last week, fine. It's like, oh yeah. So 